I guess um, when I think about my interaction uh, with the Psalms, I think back to when I was first ordained and was um, an assistant rector. And it was a time in the Church of England when we were uh, in, engaged in developing new forms of services for church. And one of the implications of that was going to be that we didn't use the Psalms so much in worship. And I remember saying in a meeting of the uh, parish council that uh, therefore it would be good to use these new services because we wouldn't be spending so much time using the stupid psalms that were so meaningless. Uh, and my rector uh, withered me across the room with a look, um, which was something he became expert at and said, my boy, one day you will need the psalms. And he was absolutely right and uh, I wished later that he'd still been alive when um, I discovered that he was right. And the context in which I discovered that really was that my first wife Anne had multiple sclerosis and as time uh, went by that got uh, worse and from my purely selfish point of view it was as if she'd abandoned me, as if she'd left me really. Uh, and I remember how this, I used to not to be able to sleep because I was um, kind of hurt and grieved about this. And I would get up and sit on the sofa uh, and cry out to God. And I realized that I was talking to God the way that the lament psalms, the protest psalms do. Uh, and that's the point at which I realized that that thing that my rector had said some years before uh, was kind of coming true. The next point at which I remember reflecting on the question about the psalms was actually in connection with the fact that uh, in the seminary where I was teaching in England, we used to have chapel every day and we used to work through the Psalms um, as part of the worship. So today it was Psalm 46, uh, tomorrow it would be Psalm 47, the next day it was Psalm 48. It was nothing to do with what you felt like or whether you were feeling crazy or whether you'd got some reason to be lamenting or something. And it made me think about the question, what do we think we are doing um, when we are using the Psalms in that way when they don't necessarily correspond to where we are in our own thinking and feeling and being and so on. And I realized two things. Uh, one was that the um, practice of the church of working through the praying of the Psalms like that was something that had the capacity to shape the way that you thought about God and the way you related to God even though it didn't necessarily correspond, a particular psalm didn't correspond to how you felt this particular day. But the other was that when you were praying, whether it was the praise psalms or the lament psalms, you were doing what Paul talks about when he talks about rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep. That is, um, with regard to the lament psalms then, if we were praying these psalms, and we or I didn't feel that I needed to pray that way for myself, there were a stack of my brothers and sisters in Christ and other human beings too, who needed to pray that way. And so the Lament Psalms came to be a way in which um, I prayed for other people, for my brothers and sisters in persecution or in need or whatever. And that came to be then something uh, very important um, uh, for my uh, new wife Kathleen and my first wife died five years ago uh, and Kathleen and I have been married now three years or so um, and uh, with Kathleen I inherited a stepdaughter uh, and a whole further family of um, uh, Kathleen's stepdaughter Katie J's uh, husband Gabriel and Katie J and Gabriel have um, given their life over the past ten years in seeking to uh, be with and uh, make known the needs of the Darfuri refugees in Sudan and in Chad. And using the uh, lament psalms, the protest psalms, came to be uh, the way in which we prayed. So we prayed again through the Psalter, not because we needed to lament. We were newlyweds, we were fine, thank you very much. Uh, but it was a way in which we uh, prayed and have continued to, to pray for the Darfuri refugees. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to, you, to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge until the destroying storms pass by. I cry to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame those who trample on me. God will send forth his steadfast love and his faithfulness. I lie down among lions, 
They greedily devour human prey. Their teeth are spears and arrows, their tongues sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my path, but they have fallen into it themselves. My heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake, my soul, awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is as high as the heavens. Your faithfulness extends to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. So, Father, we continue to uh, to ask. We, it seems that your hand, or you've let even Satan's hand, be held over the Darfur people. And we've tried in every possible way that we can think of doing what we can. And the world seems to be deaf, absolutely deaf and blind to uh, what's been going on with them for 10 years. So, Father, we ask that whatever it is that you bring your attention to them and or to us, if we are in fact to do something differently than we are doing and we can't see it, to, to please remove our blindness, we just ask you to send Jesus to walk with them and be with them as they go through these trials and that you show the blind what they need to see in order to change the situation. We trust in your sovereignty and we praise your sovereignty and we thank you for your sovereignty. Amen. One of the things that um, people, the Christians often um, comment on with regard to these protest psalms uh, is the apparently unacceptable to us way in which the Psalms ask for God to put down their enemies. Uh, it's a strange thing really that it's only in about really the last hundred years that Christians have got bothered about that. Christians before that weren't bothered and the New Testament isn't bothered. It talks that way to God and it quotes that kind of Psalm. So what is it that's weird about us? We say it's because Jesus wouldn't do that kind of thing and yet the New Testament guys don't seem to have um, made that inference. And I think part of the answer for me to the reason why we're hesitant came home when I was uh, thinking about the version of Psalm 137 that was a big hit uh, in Britain in the 1970s or 80s, but not um, here in, in the United States um, by, the, by the waters of Babylon. And it was a hit because the song uh, had, the psalm had been turned into a song by some Jamaican reggae guys. And it was a song of protest um, uh, against the empire. That is, us, us British guys. Uh, and the reason why uh, we properly, sensibly, don't, don't like those imprecatory psalms is because we are the people that God is going to act against. There's a, there's a difference between the way in which the Lament Psalms uh, work, or at least the apparent acceptability of those protests in the, in the Lament Psalms, uh, and the trouble that Israel gets into uh, in the wilderness. Uh, I, I wonder if one major reason is that in those protests of the Israelites in the wilderness, they're never protesting to God. They're, they're protesting to Moses, and that makes Moses fed up, and apparently God doesn't like it either. Don't complain to God, complain to the pastor, uh, is the assumption that the uh, Israelites are making. So maybe it's significant uh, that, as it were, what God is um, giving us permission to do in the Psalms, encouragement to do in the Psalms, is protest to him, not to protest to other people. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? From Psalm 22. Uh, and indeed, uh, also, Jesus crying out. He is picking up one of the protest psalms uh, in the way he speaks to God. So he has what you might call the natural freedom of a son in relation to a father um, and the psalms encourage us to assume that we have that same freedom. There's a kind of um, irony here I think really, well a double irony almost. The Israelites didn't talk to God as father in the literal kind of sense 
to the extent uh, that, um, that we may do. And yet they have, they have in the Psalms a kind of freedom in relation to God as children talking to a father or a mother that often it seems that Christians don't have. We feel a bit reticent about talking to God with the kind of freedom that A, the average Israelite, and B, Jesus did. That's weird, isn't it? Now, um, I hope it's the case, I think it's the case, uh, that when my two sons, who are now in their 40s, um, uh, spoke to their mother or me, um, that they would feel free to say to us anything that they needed or wanted to say, rather than have to worry about what they could say to dad or mum. And it's, it's sad, really, that Christians don't feel that freedom. <laughs>